From Hollywood, it's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Jim Madison at Tri-State. How are you? Well, Jim, I'm fine, but what's this I read about you people? You mean the Tollhurst theft, I suppose? Yeah. No progress yet? As a matter of fact, that's why I'm phoning. We tried to get you right after the robbery, but you weren't in. Well, I was on a case most of last week. Well, we had a call this morning. It was a woman who said she knew something about the case. Of course, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. What did she say? She wanted me to swear that we wouldn't call the police. And then she said she'd give us time to decide and call back about three. You want me to talk to her if she calls back? Yes, I don't know anything about these things. Are you willing to work without the police? We stand to lose almost $50,000. We'll cut some corners if you will. Edmund O'Brien in the transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Tri-State Insurance Group, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Tollhurst theft matter. I note here the accepted report of the robbery because, as will be seen, both the police and the press missed a number of details. The Tollhurst fur shop was entered at closing time Saturday evening by three disguised men who at gunpoint relieved Mr. Tollhurst of almost $50,000. Answering a radio alarm, the police spotted the getaway cars that left Hartford and later south of town after a running gunfight with another squad car that was abandoned by the four men who were seen to split up and who escaped into some wooded terrain. That's where it stood. Expense account item one, a dollar and a half cab fare from my apartment to the Tri-State offices where your Mr. Madison was waiting for me a little before 3 p.m. The second call from his alleged informer came at two minutes after. Yes? Yes, put her on. Hello? Well, I'm glad you did. I have someone here that I want you to talk to. No, no, no. He's not from the police. He's a representative of the company. Just a second. Here she is, darling. Okay. Hello? I don't like this. How do I know you're not from the police? Well, I guess you can't be sure. All I can do is give you our word. And if you do want to talk to us, you'll have to take it. The other man didn't say he was going to have somebody else. He decided he'd rather do it this way. Now, listen for a second. To us, the recovery of the money is more important than having anybody arrested. If we can recover it more easily without going to the police, we're willing to do it. Doesn't that make sense? Maybe. The police will have to come into it sometime. I know that. But also, I know I'm right. I've got my own reasons for calling like this, and I know I'm right. I'll take your word for it. And we'll keep it. Now, what is it that you know? I know where one of the men is hiding. Oh? Which one? He's in a hotel in Boston. He's not using his real name, and I can't tell you what it is. You mean you know what it is and can't tell us? I'm a friend of his. That's why I'm calling. He's got to give himself up and get clear of it. That's what you've got to make him do. I will if I can. What name is he using and what's the hotel? I know I'm right. I, I know it. But you can't tell him how you found out where he is. You can't say anything about this call. That's a promise, too. I won't. The name he's using is Taft. He's in the Standing Hotel. The Standing. Okay. Anything else? That's all. How do I get in touch with you again? You can't. There's nothing more I can do. Just be careful of him. He's awful desperate. Goodbye. Huh? She's gone. What do you make of it? It's hard to tell. She says one of them is in a hotel in Boston that I have to make him give himself up and be careful because he's desperate. She could be sincere. If she were just fingering this guy, it seems to me she would have called the police. Then you think it's worth looking into? Well, there's only one way to find out. Follow it up, see what's there. <laughs> Expense account item two, 32.50, car rental and mileage between Hartford and Boston. On the way, I tried to figure ways and means of making an appointment with a hunted armed thug, if that's what he was going to turn out to be. I found the standing hotel on the fringe of the commercial and waterfront section, and a man named Walter Tapp was registered there. I staked out his corridor and saw him leave his room at about 7.30 that evening. He came back an hour later. When he put his key into the lock, I was strolling toward him, and when he opened the door, I was behind him. 
Can you hold it a second? What do you want? I want to talk to you. I don't know you. I haven't got time. I'm interested in a man who's registered here under a phony name, Taft. That's my name. Is there anything wrong with it? Well, if it's your real name, then I'm wrong. Have you got anything that says it is? Well, I don't see how it's any of your business, but... Sure, go on in. Thanks. Now, who are you and what do you want? Uh, I guess the automatic tells me what I came to find out. Who are you? I'm a private detective. The insurance company that stands to lose on the tollers job hired me. That's a lie. You'd have brought the cops if you were. I've got a wallet in my hip pocket. There's a license. Don't reach for it. Just turn around. Sure. You're really jumpy, aren't you? Hey, catch. You don't expect me to swallow this, do you? You were hired by Alan Les. All right, so you found me. Now, what do you think you're going to do with me? You having trouble with your friends? I said, what do you think you're going to do with me? It's going to help if you can convince yourself I'm telling the truth. We want to recover the money, and if you'll help us to do it, we'll try to see that you get a break. Well, that's a laugh. How would an insurance company find out where I was? Sometimes they get a tip and the police don't. They can pay for information, the police can't. Now, where would they get a tip from? Somebody here in the hotel that figured something was wrong with you. There are fair descriptions out on you and your buddies for size and color and clothes. Somebody could have spotted you. Can't buy it. It happened. And the tip was right. You might do yourself a lot of good going to the police by yourself. Either you're off your nut or you think I am. Come on, start backing up. What for? Because I'm leaving. Go on, get started. If you were thinking straight, you'd talk it over. You're mixed up in a double cross, so you can't believe anything. That's far enough. Who told you about a double cross? You did. You said you thought I was hired by Alan Les. They were in the job with you, weren't they? All right, turn around and open the closet door. Turn around. <coughs> By the time I was on my feet again, he'd had at least 20 minutes start. After I cleaned up some in the crummy bathroom and stopped the bleeding, I looked the place over. There was nothing in it. He'd obviously checked in without anything but the clothes he'd been wearing and the automatic. That was all at the standing hotel. I drove back to Hartford and phoned Mr. Madison at home. I'm sorry, Johnny. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm not complaining. Just telling you what happened. I guess I asked for it, bullying in like that, but I couldn't think of another way to get to him alone and get to the point in a hurry. Well, do you think you should have called the police? I didn't for two reasons. They'd just be sore at us for not reporting the girl's call to them, and I hated to cross her at this point in case she might come back to us with some more information. I guess we aren't any worse off than we were before she called, are we? No, we made a little progress. We know there's trouble between the men. We're fairly sure they're all still in this part of the country, and we have a couple of first names. And if you want me to stay on the case, there's another angle I'd like to look into. What's that, Johnny? Well, from the beginning, it's bothered me that a furrier would have that much money in his store, no matter how fancy. Well, he said he hadn't banked for four days. It's still too much money. I suppose the police have covered it, but a thing like that could develop into a lead. All right, let's try it. Good. I'll go see Tollhurst in the morning. Maybe I can handle him without getting myself slugged. Of course, of course. I'm at your service. Thanks, Mr. Tollhurst. I know you've answered a lot of questions already. Yes, I have. So I won't drag you through the details of the actual theft again. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Now, the amount of money you lost, almost $50,000. That question again, why did I have that much in my shop? I have answered that question every possible way without smearing my own good name. The police have driven me mad. I'd like to have the answers, too. Very well. Don't most of your customers purchase with checks, Mr. Tolhurst, or on credit? No, they do not. I'd think that they would. Because you don't understand. The fur business, even more than the jewelry business, is concerned with making beautiful women more beautiful. Don't you agree? Sure, I do. Well... I hope this doesn't come as a shock to you that there are many, many more wealthy husbands than there are beautiful wives, as opposed to women, that is. So, uh, who would you expect these wealthy husbands to buy the furs for? Yeah, I see what you mean. Cash purchases, too, huh? Precisely. If wifey doesn't get the coat, she better not run across a check paying for one. The fur would fly, you might say. But almost 50000 in one week, that's a, a lot of intrigue. One sable was worth thirty-five. And if the name of the purchaser became known, it could literally endanger the national security. I really mean that. It would be discussed from the floor of the Senate. What can I do? 
And there's no record at all of these sales? Barely enough to keep my books legal. I've rather specialized in this cash and carry trade. If I was strapped to the rack, I couldn't name these men. I'm helpless. I think the insurance company might be able to fight your claim because of the stand you're taking. Had you thought of that? Oh. No, I hadn't. Well, it makes no difference. I'm completely helpless. Unless a member of the board or somebody is an old customer of mine. And that is possible, you know. I tried a few more approaches on Tolhurst without getting any place. I didn't fully believe him, but I did have to admit that business dealings like that were possible. I left the shop a little after 11 and went to my apartment to call in a report on this phase of the deadlock. My phone was ringing when I got there. Hello? Hello? Can't help me. What? I, I can't hear you. Who is it? Yesterday. You're the woman I talked to yesterday? Yes. You've got to help. Well, what's the matter with you? What happened? They were here. Where are you? Where are you? Stoddard. Stoddard Street? Yes. What number? 5860. 5860. An apartment number? Number 12. All right, I'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> Dollar, I'm coming in. They went after Fred. You've got to go help him. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who are you talking about? The men called Alan Les? I don't know them. First, they said I had the bunny and they beat me. One of them held my mouth so I couldn't scream and the other one hit me. Do you know where the money is? No. No, they wouldn't believe me. Then they made me tell them where Fred is. Fred is the man I saw last night at the Standing Hotel? Yeah. I can't keep quiet for him anymore. His name is Fred Terrell. And he's holding out the money. That's what they said. They said they'd kill him if they had to. They looked for him at the standing. They won't find him. He left there last night. I know. He called. I tried to lie that he was still there, but they phoned and found out he wasn't. Then they started in again until I told them. He, He moved to an auto court, and that's where they're going. Where is it? I'm not sure. Between here and Boston. But I think it's in this state. It's called the Oak Springs Motel. I tried to warn him. But whoever answered hung up because they couldn't hear what I was saying. I couldn't talk. What's your name? Virginia Cowley. Well, how do you fit into this? How much do you know about the robbery? Nothing. I didn't know about it until afterwards. Red's car was here. He came to get it and said everything had gone wrong and he was in bad trouble. Yeah. Now we all are. You should have told the police, and I should have. Promise I know. I'm going to call them now and hope I can fight my way clear of this mess. Where's the telephone? We will return you to yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Americans now have a double job to do. We must produce enough goods to supply our armed forces, and we must also see that civilian needs are met so that we can prevent further inflation. Better production means greater strength and greater insurance that our free American way will continue. Do your part. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. attempt to help what was left of my position with the police, the first thing I told them about was the possibility of nailing the 300 men together. But that backfired, too. It took me 20 minutes to learn that the Oak Springs Motel was about 12 miles south of town, and it took me another 15 minutes to get there. Two squad cars were in the driveway, and that looked all right. But when I got to the cottage where Lieutenant Crockett and the other officers were, things looked all wrong. The bodies of two men lay on the floor... Neither one was Fred Sorrell. Who are you? My name is Dollar, Lieutenant. Oh, yeah. Sorrell did this? Seems to be some confusion about the name. The 
cottage was rented by an A.J. White. Sorrell was hiding out under a couple of aliases. Too bad we didn't have that information. I didn't know who he was until a half hour ago when I called you. They were already dead a half hour ago. Is there some reason you couldn't have found out 20 minutes before that? Yeah, I didn't happen to be any place this Collie woman could get a hold of me. She's the one you just got around to turning in? That's right. It's the first time I'd even seen her. First time I knew where she lived. First time I knew anything about her. I've done the same thing before, and it's worked out. This time it didn't. What do you mean? An anonymous call. She said she had information about the Tolhurst robbery that she couldn't give to you. She gave it to me in confidence, and I played it that way. You're still playing it that way? No, no. I'll give you everything I've got, which which still isn't much. Let's go back to town where we can get a real Uh, statement. Um, Henderson, take over here, will you? I'm going back to the office. Uh Uh-oh, okay. I didn't score very heavily with the lieutenant. He listened to my story point by point, but as he mentioned, actually the only useful thing I gave him was a slightly better description of Sorrell than he'd gotten from the manager of the auto court. I don't know what to think about it, Dollar. I know you guys figure you can operate that way, and maybe at work sometime. Sure, people will talk to you when they won't talk to us, but you're always taking a chance that it'll get out of hand like this did. This one was out of hand from the beginning. And it's turned into murder now. You aren't blaming me for that, are you? No, but I want you to leave the case alone from here on. Stay away from that Cowley woman. Stay away from everything. Does that mean I can go now? Yeah. It might be a good idea if you went home and brushed up on a little police work. You're really digging it in, aren't you, Lieutenant? You've got it coming. Go on now. I've got to get back on this thing. I knew my license was probably at stake, but Crockett's attitude, right or wrong, was more than I could take. Virginia Cowley had been put in the police hospital, suffering from internal injuries caused by the beating. I went back to her address, lied my way past the landlady, and into the apartment. From a notebook on the telephone stand, I learned that Sorrell lived in Princeton. That was my next stop. Fred Sorrell? Yeah, he still lives here. I haven't seen him for some time now. Seems to me he's out of town. Ah, uh, I came all the way up from New York just to see him. You suppose I could get into his place, leave a note or something? Well, why don't you just go up and see if the other fellow's there? Name a hacker. Oh, a roommate? Yeah, you could leave a note with him. Oh, good. How do I get there? Uh, second floor, rear. Numbers 210. <laughs> Friend of Sorrell's, I've got to see you. You had to sleep in this joint. What's the matter with that jerk, anyway? Fred, when did you hear from him last? A couple of days ago. In some kind of trouble. He sure is. Wanted to borrow some money from me, the lazy jerk. Told him to go take a jump and get a job, one or both. He wanted to borrow money? Yeah, want me to mail him 50 bucks. What's the matter with him, anyway, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he's done it up pretty good. Have you heard about the Tollhurst robbery? What are you handing me? You know a couple of his friends called Al and Les somebody? Hey, who are you anyway? Uh, yeah. Detective? You are telling me Fred's mixed up in nothing as big as the Tollhurst thing. He ain't got the brains. He hasn't if he has to write you for 50 bucks after he pulled it. What about Al and Les? Yeah. Les Vernick and Al Hutchin. I met him, but that's all. They're from out of town. They're in it, too, huh? Hey, you ain't pulling my leg, are you? No. Did he write you from Boston by any chance? The Standing Hotel, using the name Walter Taft? That's right. I knew those guys were no good, and I told him so. He was always talking big money. I never thought he had the guts for anything like that. Don't congratulate him. He built it up to murder today. Oh, quit it. It must have been Alan Less. You'll read about it. But for now, take my word for it. There was a double cross, or they figured there was. They were both shot, and Sorrell is still on the loose. This is straight. He, he wouldn't come here, would he? I don't know what he'd do. He must be half crazy by now. Can you think of any place else he might go? He's got a girl he mooches off all the time. Yeah, I know about her. He wouldn't go there, not now. He'd want a place to hide out. He was driving his car so he could travel for some distance, but not far. If he's thinking at all, he'll know he has to get rid of it. I don't know. I'm not holding nothing back. A guy does anything like this, he doesn't deserve help from anybody. By well, this time, he probably thinks he does. You don't think he'd pull his old lady into the mess, do you? He might. 
Where is she? She's got a farm. I never saw it, but he talked about it once in a while. A little place she runs with an old guy helping her. It ain't far from here. Do you know where it is? Somewhere west. Uh, hey, uh, that's her picture. I think the name of the town is on it. Down here in the corner. I, I just remembered. I noticed it. Torrington. Sure, I know where that is. About 25 miles. I'd like to look at some of the rest of his stuff, if you don't mind. Go ahead. If this is as bad as you say it is, you can do anything you want. If you don't mind, I'm going to move out until this is cleared up. I don't want that crazy jerk to be coming back here while I'm around. Nothing in Sorrell's things gave a hint as to where he'd be likely to go, but to stay on the move more than for any other reason, I decided to cover the farm. And to stay on the safe side, I stopped by my apartment to pick up a pocket gun. Here? Well, it's a sort of a social call. Mrs. Sorrell here? Nope. She she went to town. Oh, she went with her. I was passing through. I know a son. I thought I'd stop by. Oh, you're a policeman, then. What makes you say that? We heard about Frederick. At least some of us did. We kept it from Mrs. Sorrell. That's why we sent him to town. We don't want that poor soul to learn about him until it's all finished. Did you think he'd come here? How much do you know about it? Uh, somebody heard on the radio about the murders. You think he'd be hidden here? Not exactly, but every possibility has to be covered. Uh, he'd never come here. He wouldn't be turned out by his mother, but the rest of us would make short work of him. Uh, you're welcome to search the place if you choose to. Has he been in touch with Mrs. Thorell through this thing? Nobody's been in touch with Mrs. Thorell. She don't read her own mail or papers either because she's blind. She don't listen to the radio or talk on the telephone because she's she's nearly deaf. Frederick is a rotten apple that hasn't been allowed back here for three years. And she doesn't know about him? Not for almost that whole time. Oh, yeah, she thinks he's a big success in the hardware business. And we've talked about it already. We, we think he's going to start a business in Australia. And his mother will think he's there until she dies. And you ain't going to tell her any different. I don't see why I should. Well, you want to search the place? No, I don't want to, but as long as I'm here. Sorrell wasn't there, and by the time I left, I was made to feel like a criminal myself for looking the place over. By the time I got back to Hartford, the extras were out, saying, widespread search fails to uncover killer. And something that had been bothering me came to mind again. Why, with a $50,000 haul, hadn't Sorrell gotten out of New England? A few more questions fell into line, too. How could an amateur like Sorrell escape a full-fledged police search? And why would he even think of a double cross on his first job? And finally, why, after running out of Boston, would he have come back to an auto court 12 miles south of Hartford? I covered the final point and learned that the Oak Springs Motel was within a few miles of the point where he and the other two men had abandoned their car and taken off on foot. I thought I told you to stay away from this case. You can't take away my right to make a living, Lieutenant. I found his car. Isn't that worth anything? How do I know what it's worth? It's something you haven't done with all your roadblocks. I'm five minutes away from his car, and I think you'll come back to it as soon as it starts to get dark. Can't you take a chance on it and have a few men out there? All my men are busy. I'll see what I can do. It's less than an hour till dark. I hope you make it. I'd come back to the auto court and then found the approximate spot where Sorrell and his friends had left their car. I'd found a pair of ruts winding through the trees, and where they'd stopped, I'd found his car. When I got back to it after talking with Lieutenant Crockett, I put my car under as much cover as I could find and waited. I was still there alone when the sun started to set. And then I heard him before I saw him. You! What are you doing here? Don't try with a gun, Sorrell. I've got one, too, this time. What are you doing here? I've been almost every place else. Doesn't make any difference to you that I'm here. There's no place for you to go anyway. You've been safe here in the trees. But you couldn't get any place else. I could make it if I wanted to. No, you couldn't. You missed when you didn't make it before everybody knew who you were. Right after you pulled the job, yes, but not now. 
You must have realized that. I can make it. Not now. Why didn't you go any farther than Boston? Why did you come back to Hartford? I had my reasons. You still got them? What do you mean? You killed Les Vernick and Al Hudson and then came right back here to the trees. I don't think you double-crossed them. I don't think you even got the money beyond this grove. You know where it is? No, I don't, Sorrell. That's only what I think. And you had to kill them because all they could figure was that you double-crossed them. You want to help me? You want to? It's here, all of it. It's too late to help. You killed them. But it's all here. Fifty thousand dollars. I... I came down the road and then... Then I turned that way. That's when they were shooting at us. I was carrying the money, but... I, I was excited. Alan, Alan Les went that way and I came this way. I, I'm sure it was here. But, yeah, I remember that big tree. I went past it. I, I'm sure. You could find $200,000 and it wouldn't do you any yes, good. Yes, it would. You could buy anything with money and it's, it's all here. I, I know it was here because I ran on this road and... Then this is where... This is where the road ends. Then I, I went past that tree. If I, I can just remember how far I went. Because I... I put it down, and I, I covered it over with some leaves. If I just saw them, I'm sure I'd remember. Sorrell. I know where it is. If I, but... Hey, what are you... I want your gun, Sorrell. Oh, get away from me! Get away! Quit it! No! It's all here! It's all here, and I'm going to get it! Now, get away from me! Get away, you... All right, Get Sorrell. away! All right! <laughs> Expense account item three, extra mileage, etc., $43.60. Expense account total, $77.60. Remarks, a police searching party finally found the satchel of missing money, so the company is not out. Lieutenant Crockett and I finally got together, so I'm not out. The girl is nothing. So it leaves Sorrell, who really lost his mind over money, and the furrier Tolhurst, who didn't lose anything, not even that universal customer, the wealthy American husband. Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Wilbur Hatch. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen starring in the Paramount Pictures Technicolor production, Silver City. Featured in tonight's cast were Parley Bear, Virginia Gregg, Stacey Harris, Bob Sweeney, Herb Butterfield, Clayton Post, and Howard McNear. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dan Coverly inviting you to join us next week at this time when Edmund O'Brien returns as Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The faith of its people is a nation's greatest strength. You can show your faith in freedom, and you can help keep America free by investing regularly in United States defense bonds. Remember, peace is for the strong, security for those who earn it. Start now investing in peace and security by investing in defense bonds. Buy an extra bond now. Buy United States defense bonds. The direction is straight ahead. No turns on your dial for the wonderful comedy of CBS Radio's two and only Amos and Andy. Enjoy Amos and Andy, the Kingfish, and the rest of those fabulous characters tomorrow night on most of these same CBS radio stations. Stay tuned now for the Vaughn Monroe Show, which follows immediately on most of these same stations. And remember, King Arthur Godfrey's Roundtable holds court Sunday afternoon on the CBS radio network.